Good Sunday morning to you. Uh, God has blessed us with another Lord's Day, which means we've made it through another week and we have the, the promise of another week that is lying ahead of us. Uh, we've got a lot to be thankful for uh, this morning as we are giving this day to the Lord and as we are pausing to uh, study from his word together. And, and I trust that you will be finding an opportunity uh, to worship God uh, in this his day. Uh, as I said, we have many blessings to be thankful for. Uh, we need to be praying for our nation as we look and hope to be turning the corner. Uh, we need to be praying for those who are in harm's way, praying for those in different parts of the world who are not as fortunate as we are during this time, who are uh, without food and without access to medical services, without their daily uh, needs. And we need to be praying very much for them. But we have our help. Uh, we have our homes. We have our, our faith and our family. Uh, there have been some great blessings this past week. Uh, some who have been tuning in and have been joining us in our study on a regular basis uh, have a great grandbaby uh, to, to enjoy and to thank God for. Some milestone birthdays uh, were enjoyed this past week. Uh, so God continues to pour his blessings upon us so richly and so abundantly. And we need to be thankful for that. I hope that you have your Bible out and you'll open to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8. I know when the announcement I sent out a, a couple of days ago, uh, I had our attention drawn to Matthew chapter 9. Uh, we're going to be looking at a pair of miracles that are actually joined together, and they're recorded in Matthew chapter 9, in Mark, in Mark chapter 5, and Luke chapter 8, and I've decided to read from and, and to follow primarily the account found in Luke. So open your Bible to Luke chapter 8, and you may find it convenient to place a marker there because we'll be turning back and looking at the other accounts uh, to bring in some added details uh, so we can understand everything uh, we can from these two miracles. Before we get started with our study, uh, let's pause and let's go to God in a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are thankful for this Lord's Day you've given us, thankful that you've brought us safely through another week, that we have this day, that we can pause and we can focus upon you. We're thankful for your word and pray that you would bless it as we read and study from it together in this format and this way. We pray that you would help us to understand things about you uh, and about your will for our lives today. We pray for those who are struggling. We pray for those who are suffering. We ask your blessings upon this nation as we go through this time. Forgive us of our sins as we repent and turn from them. In Jesus' name, we humbly pray. Amen. I want to take the time to read through the account that we have in the Gospel of Luke. And then I want to go back and and look, go through it and make sure we're understanding what is happening here, point out some things we need to. Then we're going to dive a little bit deeper and we're going to look at the, the two individuals that Jesus is encountering in these miracles. And we're going to try to see it from their point of view, try to learn some lessons that that hopefully they learned during this time and some things that they experienced during this these two miracles. Let's read Luke chapter 8, starting at verse 40. So it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged him. Now a woman, having a flow of blood for 12 years, who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, 
came from behind and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, Who touched me? But Jesus said, Somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. Now, when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Do not be afraid. Only believe, and she will be made well. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, Do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand, and called, saying, Little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately. And he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Here we have, as we pointed out, we have a miracle occurring within the account of another miracle. They are joined together by the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And, and there's a reason. There's got to be a reason that they're joined together. And we're going to explore that in a moment. But first, I, I want us to look at the, the miracle here. I want us to see the action, see what's happening here, and, and introduce the people who were involved. The text in Luke says that Jesus and his disciples arrived from the other side of the Sea of Galilee. It was there that Jesus had cast the legion of demons out of the man, and they went into the swine, and they rushed down the, the steep place and drowned in the sea, and the people there begged Jesus to leave, to go away. Well, when he gets to the other side, comes back to Capernaum, what an opposite reaction he has from the people there. He finds that a multitude has gathered and they're waiting for him to come back and they're welcoming him back. Luke proceeds immediately to introduce Jairus. Here is a man that comes to Jesus in desperation. He is identified as the ruler of the synagogue. Now, historians will tell us that the rulers of the synagogue were the individuals who were responsible for the synagogue, uh, not just for the building, but responsible also for the services that took place in the synagogue. Who was going to speak? Uh, what, what, who was going to pray? Who was going to be involved? The ruler of the synagogue had that responsibility, but also the ruler of the synagogue had a responsibility over the, the individuals who were members of the synagogue. Uh, if someone was unfaithful, he could go to them and encourage them to repent. And if they didn't, he had the authority to exclude them or excommunicate them from the synagogue. So this ruler that comes to Jesus here is not a political or, or civic ruler, but he is a very important, very high ranking person in Capernaum, in this city. But notice here he is on his face before Jesus, worshiping him, begging him to come to his daughter. He has a 12-year-old daughter, his only child, and she is sick. She's about to die. As a matter of fact, in Matthew's account, he says that she's dead. But when you look at Mark and Luke, she's about to die. He understands that her life is almost gone. He's heard about Jesus. Jesus is his last hope. So he's left his dying child to go and to get Jesus. And as we look at Mark's account, 
in Mark chapter 5 and verse 23, we see two things about this man that must have stood out to the Lord. We see his humility and we see his faith. Let's look here in Mark chapter 5. At the end of verse 22, it says, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. Verse 23, and begged him earnestly, saying, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hand on her that she may be healed and she will live. A combination of two important things there, his humility, falling before Jesus, and his faith. Come and lay your hands on her and she will live. Is it any wonder that Jesus gets up and goes with him? These two things stand out to the Lord. And so he follows this man. And along the way, a woman is introduced to us. We don't know her name, but we see that she is likewise in a desperate situation. She is suffering physically from a condition that has lasted as long as this daughter has been alive. Twelve years She's been suffering from a, an issue of blood or a hemorrhage of blood. Uh, according to Leviticus chapter 15, this would have rendered her unclean. No one was supposed to touch her. She was not allowed to go to the temple to, the temple to worship. She lived in a perpetual state of uncleanness for 12 years. The text also tells us that she'd spent all of her money on doctors she hadn't gotten any better, and Mark's account tells us that, in fact, she was getting worse. She's in a desperate situation. She hears about Jesus. She catches up to him in the crowd, and she believes that if she could just reach out and touch his clothes, she'd be healed. Remember, she's unclean. She doesn't want to make him unclean. If she could just touch his clothes, she'd be made well. She does. And the text says immediately the blood dried up. Immediately she was made well, but also immediately Jesus knew what she had done. And he stopped and he had her to acknowledge what had happened. Uh, he told her that her faith has made her well and gave her a blessing that she was to go in peace. At that moment, Messengers came from the house of the ruler of the synagogue and told him, your daughter has died. Don't bother the teacher anymore. There's nothing else he can do for you now. Let him go his way. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. Only believe she'll be well. And they go on to his house. And when they arrive at the house, they, they, they enter into a, a scene that would have been strange for you and I. The house is full of people who are mourning and wailing loudly. As a matter of fact, Matthew's account, Matthew chapter 9, verse 23, says that they were flute players and the noisy crowd wailing. You know, when we suffer the loss of a loved one in our culture, we usually like to shut the door and mourn quietly, don't we? We might receive some, some friends and family to come and to comfort us, but, but it's something that we like to do privately and quietly. In this culture, things were different. It was the custom of the Jews to hire musicians and professional lamenters to help the family mourn. This is the ruler of the synagogue. He's a, a high ranking person in this community. His daughter has died. Uh, it wasn't a sudden unexpected thing. Uh, they were ready to spring into action. They showed up there. By the time Jesus got there, they were already involved in their mourning. And Jesus says, you're not necessary. This isn't necessary. Your services are no longer needed here. She's not dead. She's just sleeping. Well, they all knew that she was dead. So they laughed at Jesus. They ridiculed him. He put them out of the house, went in, took the little girl by the hand, told her to arise, and immediately she rose up. The parents were astonished. They were amazed, rightly so. And Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone 
but how could something like that be kept a secret? There was just a house full of people there who knew she was dead. Next thing they know, she's alive. Uh, it's no wonder Matthew 9, 26 says that the report of this event went into all that land. What an incredible pair of miracles that happened here on this account, on this occasion. What I'd like to do, I'd like for us now to dig a little bit deeper and to, to look at these miracles primarily from the point of view of the ruler of the synagogue and the woman who was healed by Jesus. Uh, we could and probably should make some observations about this miracle, uh, that, that it was done for a purpose, not to benefit uh, the recipients physically or emotionally, although that, that was a benefit. The miracles were done to prove that Jesus was the Son of God, to, to prove that he was speaking the truth, to prove that the kingdom had indeed come near unto them. Uh, there are some things that are very typical about these two miracles that, that are typical about all the Lord's miracles that are not typical of miracles that are claimed today. Notice this woman was healed immediately. This girl rose up immediately. As you study the miracles that Jesus performed while he was here on this earth, that word immediately shows up all the time. It wasn't something that was hidden. It wasn't something that was gradual. It was a miracle when Jesus healed. It was a miracle. And there's no doubt that these miracles occurred. Well, let's dig a little bit deeper. Let's, let's, let's consider some things. I've been studying these miracles this past week. I want to share some things with you that, that have come to my attention in studying this out first. Let's address the question, why are these two miracles put together? I've got a lot of books back here that help me in my study, and I have several books that address the miracles of Jesus. I noticed that one of them treated these two miracles separately. But for the most part, these miracles are studied the way they've been recorded and preserved in Scripture. They're together. That tells us that that they belong together. The Holy Spirit put them together. But why do they belong together? What do they have to do with each other? Well, this thought came to my mind as I was studying. Both of these individuals were in desperate situations. Neither one outranked the other. While the ruler of the synagogue had a very pressing need, his daughter was about to die. There was a woman who'd been carrying a burden for 12 years. And this woman had been carrying this burden for 12 years. She was in a hopeless situation. She was only getting worse. And here's a man who's about to lose his only child. You know what this miracle reminds us of? The fact that it reminds us of is that when you and I are suffering, we are not the only ones who are suffering. When you and I are having the worst day in our lives, guess what? Someone else, somewhere else is having it too. <laughs> Someone else is having the worst day in their lives. We do not suffer alone. We're not the center of the universe. We are not the only people in our world that matter. Now, when we are suffering, when we do have that worst day ever, we can approach it one or two, one of two ways. We can either just focus on ourselves and forget about everybody else, or we can realize that others are suffering, and we can be sympathetic to the needs of others, and even try to reach out and help others as well. We studied on Wednesday night in the book of Philippians at chapter 2, at verses, uh, verses 3 and 4. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, 
But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other another better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. This wise admonition does not go away when we're in a desperate situation. We need to be remembering that we're not the only ones. I ran across a saying when I first started preaching the gospel, ran it in a couple of bulletins. Uh, I forget the exact wording, but the idea of it is, if you help somebody else row across the lake, you find that you get to the other side yourself. We are not the only ones experiencing life. We're not the only ones who are suffering. There are others who have needs as well. The second thing that comes to my mind with this, this incident and these miracles is that Jesus has time for everyone. Jesus has time for everyone. There were a lot of people who were making demands on the Lord's time and attention. Remember, he shows up. He sails with his disciples back across the Sea of Galilee, and there's a welcome party there. And they're not just, just waiting to welcome him back home. They want his time and his attention. He's been performing miracles. So everybody was wanting his time, wanting his attention as he was walking on to uh, the home of this, this ruler of this synagogue. This is the crowd was pressing in on him. They were thronging him, pressing in on him. That Greek word is the same word that is used for, for when a prisoner is apprehended and arrested and the, the, the soldiers lay their hands on him. When I think about this crowd that is making its way to the, the house of Jairus, I don't see them as just strolling along down the sidewalk. I think about the mall at Christmas time and how you have to fight your way through. Do you remember being in a crowd? It wasn't so long ago we could do that. That's what this was. This was a, a, a crowd. They had to work their way through the crowd to get to where they were going. Everybody's pressing in on Jesus, but, but Jesus made time for everyone. In Matthew's account of this miracle, Mark and Luke go straight to Jairus, coming with the request. But Matthew has Jesus healing a lame man, calling Matthew to follow him. Jesus and his disciples eating with tax collectors in the, at the house of Matthew, where he's criticized there by the Pharisees answering a question about fasting from the disciples of John the Baptist, going to the house of this ruler of the synagogue, stopping and addressing this woman who came to him and touched him to be healed. You know what we see as we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? The kingdom indeed was coming and the kingdom was open to everyone. It didn't matter who you were. The kingdom was open to everyone. And you know what? It still is. It still is. The Lord has time for everyone. And you know what that means? If he has time for everyone, the Lord has time for me. Yeah, it's, it's easy to fall into that trap of I'm lost in a sea of humanity and, and, and nobody cares and God doesn't care. And the scriptures simply show that isn't true. The Lord has time for me. The Lord has time for you. Now, the question is, do you have time for the Lord? Don't tell me you don't have time for the Lord. That's all we got now is time. The Lord has time for you. Do you have time for the Lord? The third thing that I see in these two miracles is that Jesus acknowledges and encourages faith in others. Jesus was performing miracles, and these miracles made people marvel. But it also caused some people to have faith. It caused some people to have faith to Jesus. Some people came to Jesus out of curiosity. 
Some people came to Jesus with loved ones to be healed, but there were some people who came to Jesus out of faith because they believed that he was who he said he was and believed that he could do the things that people were saying he could do. And it was those people that Jesus noticed. Those people got the Lord's attention. J J Jairus was a man of great faith. Let's go back to Mark chapter 5 and verse 23. Now I want to read this passage again. This is Mark's account of when, when this man, this ruler, comes to Jesus. When he saw him, he fell at his feet, verse 23, and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. Notice this man didn't come to Jesus and say, if you can do something, would you please help? He didn't come and say, I hope that you could do this. He came and said, I know you can do it. My daughter needs you. I need you and I know you can do this. This is interesting. As we read the gospel accounts, most of the time we have the disciples following Jesus, don't we? You know what we have on this occasion? We have Jesus following this man. Why? He's a man of faith. He's a man of faith. And his strong faith is contrasted even with those of his own household. Because later on, there are going to be messengers sent from his house who are going to come to him and say, your, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. What does that mean? That means he can't help you anymore. Let him go and help somebody else. It's too late. He can't do anything. Yeah, he can. But they didn't believe it. When he got to the house, the mourners who were there, he said, she's not dead. She's only sleeping. They laughed. They ridiculed him. They didn't believe. Who's the man who continued to believe? J. Iris. He was a man of great faith. And, and how about this woman? How about the incredible faith that she had? Put yourself in her position for a moment. She's not a tax collector, a notorious person. And she's not the ruler of a synagogue. She's not a prominent member of the community. For one, she's a woman. And in that culture, that put her a notch below. She is unclean because of her physical condition. She's not allowed to touch anyone, according to the law of Moses. Compared to Matthew, compared to... And, and Jesus is eating in his house compared to this man that comes and, and falls before Jesus. And Jesus gets up and walks away with him Co compared to him. She's a nobody. She doesn't even rank. She, does, she doesn't even register. And as, as she sees Jesus go away with this important man. How many people do you know who would be tempted to say, oh, forget it. And turn and walk away. But she didn't. She didn't. She worked her way through that crowd. She worked her way up to Jesus and she reached out and touched the edge of his clothes. Why? Her faith. Look in Mark's account of, of this incident. In Mark chapter 5, verses 27 through 29, when she heard about Jesus, pause right there she had faith when she heard about him she believed it she had faith and acted out of that faith when she heard about jesus she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment for she said if only i may touch his clothes i shall be made well and immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed from the affliction she acted out of faith, and this faith stood out to the Lord. Here they are making this procession, making their way to this man's daughter, and Jesus stops out of nowhere and says, who touched me? Nobody. 
Nobody uh, admitted to it. Peter and the rest of the disciples say, Lord, that's a ridiculous question. Everybody is touching you. We can't hardly walk through this crowd. Everybody's touching you. What, what do you mean who touched you? And Jesus says, no, I know that someone touched me because I felt the power go out from me. Yes, there might have been a lot of people touching him and bumping into him, but power only went out to one. And Jesus knew who this was. He knew who this woman was, but he's calling for her to step forward, to acknowledge what she did, why she did it, and what happened. This would verify the fact that a miracle had happened and it gave the Lord an opportunity to acknowledge her faith. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. What is it that causes you and me to stand out in the crowd, in that big old crowd in the mall? When we're shopping, we get lost in a sea of, of humanity, get lost in a sea of faces. What is it that makes you and me stand out to the Lord? Now, God knows everyone. He knows everyone who's born and everyone who passes and everything in between. A bird doesn't fall out of the air without the Lord knowing. So he certainly knows everyone. But what causes us to get the Lord's attention? It's our faith. If you look in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 10, Matthew chapter 8 and verse 10, Jesus here is, is approached by a centurion asking him to heal his servant. And as, as you go through and read the gospel accounts and look at the miracles of Jesus, one consistent theme that you see is the reaction of the people. They are amazed. They marvel. Jesus makes men marvel by his teaching and by his miracles. What makes Jesus marvel? Matthew chapter 8 and at verse 10, when Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And God knows who we are. God knows what's happening to you. You know what it is that makes us stand out to the Lord? It's our faith. This man had a great faith. This woman had a great faith. And Jesus drew attention to that. The fourth and final thing I want to share with you this morning, that not only does Jesus acknowledge our faith, Jesus also reassures our faith. I was thinking about this father, thinking about this, this ruler of this synagogue. He's in a desperate situation and time is of the essence. My daughter is dying. She's as good as dead. But I know that if you'll go back, you can do something. She will live. And so they're making their way. I wonder what J. Iris thought about Jesus stopping and addressing this woman. I mean, the clock is ticking. All right, the, the woman, she's already been healed. She's already been made well. What are we stopping for? We need to get on. We, we need to get to her immediately. There's that word. We need to be going now. We need to do this immediately. But Jesus stops and, and takes the time to address this woman. I wonder how Jairus handled that situation. I wonder if he stood there patiently or if he was saying, come on, let's, let's go. How did he handle this? And you know that the text says in, in chapter 8, Luke chapter 8 and verse 49, that before Jesus could finish giving the blessing to the woman, the messenger showed up and told Jairus, your daughter is dead. Don't trouble the teacher anymore. What must have happened to him? What, what must have gone through his mind as his greatest fears were just confirmed? His beloved daughter, his only child, was dead. It happened. They didn't get there soon enough. 
some of you that are listening to me, you know exactly how we felt. Others, it's not hard for us to imagine how he felt. The pain, the shock, the grief, as those words would sink in and, and they would be understood and would completely change the man's heart. And we know what, what he would have gone through in those, those moments after he heard those words. Here's the point. He never went through any of that because the text tells us that as soon as the that report was given to this man but when jesus heard it he answered him saying do not be afraid only believe she will be made well i've highlighted this verse in my bible this week we serve a merciful Savior. If, if you want to try to put this in real time, here's Jesus telling the woman, your faith has made you well. Go, don't, your daughter is, is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Don't be afraid. Only believe she will be well. Jesus didn't allow this man to have the time to go through the suffering that that news would have brought him. Immediately, he reassures him that everything is going to be okay. I need this verse today. Many of us need this verse. You know, there are times in our lives when we get knocked down. There are times that, that we see things coming and we can brace ourselves, but there are other times that devastation comes out of left field. We don't see it coming and it knocks us to the ground. And we don't know how we're going to get up. And for a moment, we might not even care if we do get up. We're hurt. We're hurting. Everything's been stripped away. And Satan is there with his message. Don't bother with Jesus anymore. He hadn't helped you. Give up on him. Don't bother with that anymore. Brethren, listen to me. It's at times like that. And if it hasn't happened in your life yet, it will. It's at times like that. That our faith needs to be strong enough. That we can still hear the echo of those words spoken by our Savior some 2,000 years ago. Don't worry. Don't be afraid. Only believe. Everything will be well. Now get up and let's keep going. That's what Jesus did for that man. When he heard that he lost his daughter, when he heard that he lost his world, Jesus stepped in immediately. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Everything will be well. Jesus would say the same thing to you and to me when we get knocked down in our lives today. Don't listen. To the voice of Satan who says, don't bother Jesus anymore. Don't bother with him anymore. No, let's listen to the Lord. Get up. Let's keep going. Keep your faith. Everything's going to be well. What do we learn when we look at this miracle within a miracle? These two miracles that have been joined together. Fused together by the Holy Spirit. What do we learn? Well, we learn that. When we're struggling, others are struggling too. We're not the center of the universe. God is. And until we acknowledge that, we're going to be miserable people. And we're going to make people around us miserable too. Secondly, the Lord has time for me. There's no question about that. The question is, do I have time for the Lord? Third, 
the Lord looks for and acknowledges our faith. He sees it. And for the Lord, when we're down, the Lord wants to reassure and, and encourage our faith. And no, he doesn't speak to us directly. But as I said, if our faith is strong enough, faith comes by hearing the word of God. If our faith is strong enough, we can hear the words. We can hear it. The Lord wants to encourage us when we're down. We need to let him. Great things were happening during the Lord's ministry. Some of them are on the surface and they're obvious and easy to see. But when we take the time to dig in and, and, and insert the human element, we can learn so much more. What a powerful and merciful Savior Jesus was and is for us today. Is he your Savior? He wants to be. You need to become a Christian today if you're not. You need to start living and showing that faith if you haven't already. If you want to know about becoming a Christian, you'd like to study that further, private message me. I'm not hard to get a hold of. I would love to be able to help you to study and to know what, what the Lord requires to be a Christian. If you are a Christian and you get knocked down, don't stay down. Get up. Keep going. We're going to make it there together one day. Thank you for following along, studying together with me. Lord willing, on Wednesday night at seven o'clock, we'll continue our study of the book of Philippians. We'll be in chapter two and we'll look at verses 12 through 18 and we'll talk about shining as lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. That's always timely. But that's where we'll be, Lord willing, on Wednesday night. Until then, I hope you have a great week. And I hope that you will let your light shine before others. And I hope that you'll remember that we serve a merciful and powerful Savior. Thank you very much.